Okay, so here is a conversation that I had with my friend Beth. And this is something that she had brought up about these elves, these people that we've come to know as mythological creatures in fairy tales and fantasy. Sometimes they're good and they do wonderful things for mankind. And other times they're mischievous and nefarious. So which is it, right? Also, have you ever considered that there might be more to elves than just fantasy, fiction, and mythology? Is it possible that they were an actual group of people or beings on the earth outside of fairy tales? And if so, why was their history covered up? And why were they painted as little mythological creatures in fiction and fantasy? We're going to talk about that in today's Insight with Beth. We're going to take a deep dive into history and archaeology, and we're going to talk about all these interesting artifacts that point to this theory. And in doing so, Beth is going to bring up a book, and she's going to talk about how you really have to take this book with a grain of salt. I have read it, and I agree 100% that there are a lot of things in this book, a lot of theories and opinions that I do not agree with. But the value that we both have found in this book is just based on the facts that are presented. The actual evidence, the pictures, the ancient texts, all of that is what we have enjoyed about this book. But the opinions of the author are a little bit out there and just don't seem to make sense with what we know in our doctrine. Okay, so having said that, I also wanna point out that it's interesting that a lot of these topics that I have been studying all year seemed to present themselves in this book and were an additional witness to those topics and things that I've been studying. So you're gonna hear more about those topics in some upcoming videos. But without further ado, I give you today's Insight with Beth. Oh, also interesting, this book I was reading um, it was talking about how there was this group of people from Ireland that gave rise to the, the name of a fairy. And anyway, it just went through like the language and the names they were known as and that the name that they went by derived from followers of El, E-L, um, that relate to the, the, the Hebrew references of that word to God, El, um, talks about Elohim being plural and not just one God. <laughs> um, anyway, it was all very interesting, but talked about this group in ancient Ireland that I guess you'd have to follow the, <laughs> read what it says in the book. It's, it's very interesting and in how it follows that. But it talked about that they were um, one of the most noblest race uh, on the earth, looked up to for wisdom and their connection to um, this high God of the heavens. And um, anyway, I just thought it's very interesting. This goes along with some things we've been talking about um, with those sacred bloodlines that may have resided there in Ireland. It's just kind of very interesting. So anyway, anywho, just, just some things, thoughts that, of things we've been talking about. The elf thing, that's so interesting. I literally was just reading about that last week and uh, took screenshots of it because... I think, I think there was a discussion on fairy tales and the origin of them, and it was in a homeschool group with people from all faiths, so it wasn't just Latter-day Saints. So I was trying to word it carefully, but there was a couple of them in there that are like, I was taught as a kid, my Christian faith, you do not read fairy tales because it's they're terrible and they're horrible and they'll lead you astray. And, and, but now I'm like an adult, and I think that that might not be what's going on with fairy tales. And so they were like trying to figure out like what are the origins of fairy tales and where do they come from? Are they evil? Or are they good? What are they? So I kind of picked it and was like, well, actually, <laughs> there's you know there's um, they're meant to teach us about Christ and His return to collect His people. And you'll see patterns of um, the bridegroom and the bride, or you know the prince coming to collect. Um, the princess kind of thing and how um, he's the one that has to step in and save her and he usually wakes her up she usually can't wake up on her own and like you know there, and usually he defeats a dragon or some kind of bad guy he actually kills them off and anyway that's stuff that we've all talked about but um 
in the midst of that, someone was like, well, what's your sources for, like, stuff like this? Where are you learning this from? And I was like, oh, here's a book, and here's a book. And I was trying to find the sources. And in one of the books I'd been reading, I went through kind of a detailed, um, very detailed of, like, where the whole elf name comes from. And um, if I understand it right, it originated with these these people, um, which were in France, actually, southern France, but I'm sure, honestly, they're probably connected to all the Celtic people, because seriously, they're all connected. <laughs> um, anyway, his book was really interesting, because it goes through, like, the origins of, of where the names of elves and leprechauns and fairies came from. Oh, they were the fairy people. That's what it was, not the elves. Anyway, I'm going to put the screenshot here, because I was like, I just took screenshots of this. <laughs> So I'll put that here and then I'll just read it really quick since I know you usually listen while you're doing stuff. So now this book, it's it's really interesting. I think you would really um, enjoy the stuff it talks about. This particular author, his name's, I think his name's Lawrence Gardner. I'll, I'll have to double check. But he wrote a ton of books that are about like bloodline of the Holy Grail, origins of, of holy bloodlines, even like from back in the days of Abraham and stuff. Like, it goes back in time quite a bit. Ruling Bloodlines of Europe. He does a whole bunch of books. I mean, like, seven to ten books he has out there. I don't even know if he's alive anymore. But all of his books are out there. This particular one was called The Lord Rings. That's what it was. Like, something about The Lord Rings. I've talked about this before, but how, like, anciently there was a system of, like, nine judges that would kind of rule over a people. And they're very benevolent, and they're very self-sacrificing, and it switched from that, in medieval times, it switched from that to, you know, one ruler that's in charge of everything, and he taxes the people and builds up castles to himself, blah, blah, blah. But before that, it used to be set up like the Book of Mormon, like with a system of judges, so it's really interesting. He's not a member at all. Um, In fact, I don't think he's Christian, but he noticed this pattern in historical records and they were called the ring lords they usually all wore special rings and that's where the lord of the rings comes from so anyway at least that was the inspiration for that story but the thing with him is some of his writings he's kind of talked about like he presents the historical facts and then he'll kind of come in and say well my personal belief is i kind of side with this people over here like he'll take two different peoples and say let's compare the record of the hebrews with the record of the um, the edomites specifically um, which you know are like we're the descendants of esau that went astray and he'll basically say like look at their records they're totally conflicting they're both talking about the same gods but they obviously have different viewpoints of these gods and then he'll be like, I tend to side with the Edomites. I think they had it right. <laughs> so some of his writing, when I read it, I have to take it with a grain of salt because he's seeing things through eyes that don't completely understand. Do you know what I mean? He definitely doesn't have the background of the gospel to help things make sense. But he also doesn't even have the light of Christianity to help things make sense. <laughs> So um, he does report the facts, but when he shares his viewpoint, you have to read his stuff with understanding the gospel and just be able to take in like, oh, thanks for gathering that information for me so I can interpret it through the lens of faith. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, I don't share him as a source too much because of that. I like. I feel like you, you're the same, like you have that vision too. Like you can read something and be like, you know, toss aside the stuff that is an interpretation that's incorrect and go, oh my goodness, look at this. And you can pick out the parts that, you know, because of your gospel understanding as well. So anyway, anyway, so I'll share it down here below. It's the same source that had that writing about Mary Magdalene with her customary long reddish hair. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Realm of the Ring Lords. That's what that book is called. Okay, I'm going to put it below, and then I'll read it to you so you don't have to stop and read over it. Okay, it was this chapter, and I found this all online for free, which was really nice. And then I could just kind of search keywords and just read, like, little parts of this book. So prior to the Grail's formal subjugation by the Church Inquisition in the Middle Ages, so by the Catholic Church, the victimized Christians included the Cathars, the pure ones, as they were called, of a Languedoc region of the south of France. The Cathars, and this is where fairy tale stories come from, is is this group from 
the south of France called the Cathars. The Cathars were fully conversion with the ring lord culture and in accordance with tradition referred to the messianic bloodline as the elven race venerating them as the shining ones okay so this french group that is not that is the group fairy tales come from they were not the elves but they mentioned the elfin culture saying they were of the messianic bloodline Ooh, so cool. And they call them the Shining Ones. Okay, I'm totally going to go find the page before this because it had what I wanted to give you, which is where they do this whole breakdown of the name, of where the name Elf came from. And it relates back to the Hebrew word El, like God. (laughs) So, okay, next paragraph. In the language of the old province, a female elf was an albi, um, A-L-B-I, or also spelled E-L-B-E, or Y. L-B-I. And the Albi, so the female elves or the female descendants of Christ, was the name, Albi was the name given to the main Cather Center in Languedoc. Oh, so maybe they were descendants. Okay, so they were saying they were descendants of a female descendant of Christ. Interesting. Uh, this was in deference to the matrilinear, so I guess matriarchal, heritage of the Grail dynasty. For the Cathars were supporters of the original Albigens. Okay, I have to stop. <laughs> what does this mean? This was in defense of the matriarchal heritage of the Grail dynasty. For the Cathars were supporters of the original Albigens, the elven bloodline, which had descended through the Grail queens of yore, was such as Lilith, Miriam, Bathsheba, and Mary Magdalene. It was for this reason that when Simon de Montfort and the armies of Pope Innocent III descended upon the region in 1209. It was called the Albigensian Crusade. I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyway, that is kind of interesting. So they connected themselves back to the Elven lines, um, the female Elven lines. That is so interesting. Um, through some 35 years, tens of thousands of innocent people were slaughtered in the savage campaign, all because the inhabitants of the region were upholders of the original concept of grail kingmanship. Okay, that's what I was just talking about. So they were killed because they were connected to this original grail, this original right to rule, and somebody didn't want them to have that right. Probably the Roman Catholic Church, that's what it's talking about. All because they were upholders of the original Grail kingship as against the inappropriate style of monarchy, which had been established by the papal machine. Papal meaning the Pope machine. So that's who the Catholic Church is who put like kings in place instead of having this system of judges. But the Cathars were rather more than the lowly culprit, apostate culprit, which propagandist histories would have us believe. And then I skip a whole bunch of pages. So if you're interested, let me know. <laughs> And I'll go pull the other ones up and read them for you. Maybe I should go do that anyway. Um, Let's see. The next part, I skipped ahead to page 30. So, like, I skipped six pages of other stuff he talks about with this topic. But it talks about fairies. The concept of fairies and the fairy folk was born directly from dragon and Greek lord cultures. Being a derivative of fae, old French for fairy, and relating especially to fate. In the Gaelic world, certain royal families, especially those of the Pendragons, were said to carry the fairy bloodline, that is to say, the fate or destiny of the Grail bloodline and of humankind at large, while the elf maidens of the Albigens were the designated guardians of the earth, starlight, and forest. It is for these reasons that fairies, elves, and leprechauns have so often been portrayed as shoemakers and lamplighters, for the fairy cobblers made the shoes which measure, measured the steps of life, while the shining ones of the elven race were there to light the way. Oh, that's so interesting. In national terms, though fairies present a widespread image, they are particularly associated with Ireland, where they are epitomized by the ancient people of the Tuatha de Danann. This formidable king tribe was nevertheless mythologized by the Christian monks who rewrote the majority of Irish history to suit their own church's vested interest in Ire, E-I-R-E, from a base of the monastic text, which arose onwards from medieval times. It is, and then I didn't didn't copy past that. (laughs) 
So anyway, it is really interesting. I haven't read the whole book, but that chapter was, uh, I thought, just thoroughly interesting and kind of goes with this discussion. So the one I really wanted to share with you was the origin of the word elf and where that comes from and how it developed into that word because it totally shows its like links to Hebrew. So anyway, he does throw some theories out there that I just kind of skipped some of those. But uh, here's the origins of the word elf I thought was super interesting. Okay, the concept of calling the princely race of the grail, the shining ones, while also defining them as elves, dates well back in the ancient Bible times and can be traced in Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Canaan, Palestine. Some of the best modern research into the logical roots of the long-distant BC years has been conducted by the writers Christian and Barbara Joy O'Brien. They explain that the ancient word El, which was used to identify a god or a lofty one, as an El Elyon or El Shaddai, actually meant shining an old Mesopotamian sumer. To the north of Babylonia, the derivative Elu meant shining one, as did Ailu in a cock. And the word spread across Europe to become Elul in Wales, Ailul in Ireland, Elf in Saxony, and Elf in England. The plural of El was Elohim, uh, the very word used in Old Bible texts to denote the gods, but strategically mistranslated to conform to the one god image to the judeo-christian one god image interestingly in gaelic cornwall southwest england the word el was the equivalent of the anglo-saxon engel and the old french angle i guess which in english became angel so when i think it's really interesting that he addresses that where it talks about god in the old testament the translation that they put for that was a mistranslation everywhere where it was supposed to be elohim they put just god and it was really the gods it's like more than one uh, which i think we've discussed but uh it's really neat to think of Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother Luther working as one during the creation or working together during that. It's just pretty neat to think about that and that that is supported in the text with Elohim, that every time where it says Elohim, it's actually talking about at least more than one God working together. And I think that's really interesting that I've only heard our church explore that before. I feel like I'll Everybody else just kind of ignores that <laughs> or doesn't know about it, right? So anyway, pretty interesting. So anyway, so the elf word came from L and it, and the shining ones, that's what it traces back to is this kingly race of the grail that they were called the shining ones, that they were said to be of the messianic bloodlines. But even like way back in old times, that word was being used to mean the shining ones, and it also led to words like angel, which is really interesting. Um, especially in Cornwall, I feel like I've studied a lot on that area lately, and they had a lot of connections to um, Ephraimites and things like that. There is, though, so then he's talking about, like, okay, so where do these shining ones come from? That's the next part. And he explores his theory, maybe it was an alien race, and then he goes into this one. Um, the shining ones of the Elohim. So that's what it meant. So the shining ones of the Elohim. That's what, that's what elf means. <laughs> as indicated in Sumerian writings as far back as 3rd millennium BC. So this is even like before Christ. This, this phrase was coming about. And one of the parts, and I didn't put it here, but I kind of talked about how these shiny ones were linked back to basically Adam and Eve. And, which I mean, I know everybody is linked back to. So I'm thinking it was the line of Adam and Eve that had the priesthood. That's what I'm thinking it probably was talking about. But I don't, maybe there's links to people in the city of Ephraim. That, I mean, there's so much we don't know about that, you know. But anyway, kind of interesting. So, the shining ones of the Elohim, so of the great of the great um, father and mother God, which is interesting. Okay, so it goes on. There is, though, another school of thought. There's a notion that they were the remnant of an advanced earthly race 
which had persisted from early times, with their coming down relating more to a geographical high place, perhaps a more mountainous or more northern country, rather than the skies. In fact, it nevertheless that, that both concepts are possible, and neither should be discounted out of hand in favor of the other, for the solution seems to lie in the chronological timing of events in those far-off days, and the chances are that both conclusions are correct. Maybe I should put the other part in here. I was talking about maybe the Anandai Kair people of Earth City of Enoch. It goes on, a monastic text which are onwards from medieval times, it is generally stated that these people were the supernatural tribe of the pre-Archean agricultural goddess Dane of Argos, or perhaps of the Aegean mother goddess Danu, but their true name, rendered in its older form, was Tunda Danu. As such, they were the people or tribe of Anu, the great sky god of the Anunnaki. So, um, I do remember reading this in that book I was reading about Portugal. Like, I don't know, remember, I was talking about that earlier this year. And they were describing these people, and like the north of Portugal and the north of Spain, they were um, connected to these people of back in the cultic er areas, and they were said to be the followers of Anu, and they were um, they were people of light, and they were called the people of light, and then like the things that they described them with, they're like, oh, these are people that have the priesthood, right? But they're like, yeah, they were great followers of this great female god. I'm like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. So anyways, this helped clear that up, that they were said to be uh, following a female god in medieval times by the historians writing things down. They were like, yeah, they were following a female god. Um, but actually, their original name was they were followers of people of the god Anu, the great god of the Anunnaki, who were related back to these these elves, the people of Elohim. So they were actually, it was actually a male god that they were following. That was the great god of the sky. So that made a lot more sense. Oh, this goes back to what you were talking about with how did they get rid of the ruling class so that they could become the ruling class, meaning like, you know, the whether it was the church or church, the Catholic church at the time, or um, other groups and families that wanted to be the ruling class. How did they get rid of the ones that have been ruling for all these years? And this is how it addresses it. It is often said that in strategically mythologizing the heritage of this noble um, BC race, the Christian church was responsible for dubbing them fairies. But this is not strictly true. The Tuati Danu were always fairies in the ring lore tradition, but what the church did was redefine the meaning of the word fairy. In life, when confronted with a seemingly insurmountable problem, one could either submit, the, submit to the stress and pressure that it causes, or alternatively, one could mentally diminish the problem. This does not mean that the problem goes away, but it can appear less harassing and more controllable. And that was precisely what the church did with the tu Tuati Danu, or the people of light, the people of Anu, the elves. They reduced the problem by diminishing the nominal significance of the ancient king tribe, and in so doing, portrayed them as minute little figures who were moved into the realm of mythology. Because of this, the mini miniaturizing of their figures caused a parallel dimension of their history and their proud legacy was lost from the stage of western education onwards from the year 751 the church sought out all possible measures to diminish the status of any royal strain emanating from the original ring lords so that the fraudulent donation of constantine could be brought into play. Henceforth, only the subjugative church could determine who was and was not a king, while the elves and fairies of the Albigens were maneuvered from the forefront of history into a realm of apparent fantasy and legend. In this regard, it is significant that the elves and Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings are quite unlike the cute little characters of many fairy tales, actually larger and more powerful than average mortals. They are also endowed with greater powers of wisdom. They ride magical horses and clearly and closely resemble the ancient king, king tribe of the Tunur de Anu. Settling in Ireland from about 800 BC, 
the noble Tuadi Danil hailed from the Central European lands of Scythia. Now that's really interesting because Scythia, they have linked to these royal bloodlines in other places too. And I've also seen them linked to Jaredites. So the Scythian thing is always very interesting to me because it keeps popping up. I don't know if you've heard about Scythians before. The only time I'd heard of them before they started coming up and all this stuff was uh, the tennis shoes among the Nephites guy. He worked them into one of his books one time. And um, all I remember is they were like crazy warlords. They were like so good at war. That's all I remember. <laughs> and they were greatly feared um, because of how powerful they were. And my understanding is they think a lot of the Celtic group came from the Scythians. Anyway, there's some kind of link there. There's a link between this group, and I think they were down in Germany. They were in Central Europe somewhere. Anyway, maybe they'll talk about it more here. But there's something with them, and they keep coming up quite a bit, so that's very interesting. So settling in Ireland from 800 years before Christ, this noble group, the Tuadi de Anu, hailed from the Central European lands of Scythia. The Black Sea Kingdom was stretched from the Carpathian Mountains and Transylvanian Alps across the Russian River Don. They were strictly known as the Royal Skiffs, and their classification as fates or fairies occurred because they were masters of a transcendent intellect called the She, which was known to the Druids as the web of the wise. A druid was itself a Gaelic word for witch. Now see, I don't, this is where I'm like, this is different from other stuff I've heard because druid I've heard is linked to the word David and everything I'm seeing from druids, at least how they originally were, they seem to have the temple rites and the priesthood um, or they were getting awfully close to mimicking them. Maybe they started being called this word witch by those that didn't understand them or be like, how did they have these powers we don't seem to have kind of thing? Who knows? An English form of the Saxon verb meaning to bend or yield, as does a willow or wicker. The Druids were also said to yield to the consummate city, a word which eventually became a colloquial term for fairy. Interestingly, the Scythian warlords of the city were also called the Sumar Sumairi. In the language of Old Ireland, to where many of the cast migrated, the word Sumairi was related to the coiled serpent. The point is <laughs> that these elves and fairies do seem to be linked back to groups that had the priesthood and that seemed to be followers of Christ and the Messiah that may have been separated from the Hebrew groups for whatever reason. Maybe they you know, were a group like Lehi's group that left and so maintained the priesthood, or maybe they're offshoots of Nephites, or maybe they're offshoots of Hebrews. Um, it's kind of interesting, but it's interesting that, that these different groups were still trying to practice, and their descendants were still looking forward to the Savior's return, and they had different teachings in the Catholic Church, and their teachings were deemed dangerous enough by the Catholic Church to to kind of launch a smear campaign against them, kind of demoralize them or diminish them or whatever. You know, it's kind of really interesting. So anyway, so basically the elf word traces back to a group of people that were known by a name that translates to the shining ones of Elohim. And they were said to be more powerful and have more wisdom than the rest of humankind and were a kingly race that led groups. Fairies somehow related back to it too. I can't remember how. They're often portrayed as shoemakers and lamplighters on legends because the fairy cobblers made the shoes which measured the steps of life while the shining ones were of the elven race and they let they were there to light the way for humankind. Now I thought this was really interesting because Enoch there are stories that Enoch was a shoemaker, and that comes from, I don't remember if it's the Apocrypha or if it's the Book of Enoch, but one of them, it talks about how when he got his call to do what he did, that he was just like a humble shoemaker, and he was kind of overwhelmed by that, and I don't want to misquote it because it's been a while since I heard it, but I remember that really stood out to me because I'm like, oh, that's so cool just to know what his occupation was, you know? It's like when I learned Nephi was like a, a blacksmith. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's so cool. 
um, or most likely a blacksmith because how much he talks about how to build things with metal and um, the different kinds of like he just had such a great knowledge of all that stuff and he was able to like recreate Laban's sword and he was like amazed by Laban's sword and the workmanship because he had been working on making swords <laughs> you know what went into that so anyway yeah but I just thought oh that's really interesting that these elves this elven people were said to be like in legends they're like the little shoemakers like the little elves in the shoes right that would come and fix the shoes for the shoemaker all the time or things like that and the fairies they like light the way they, they you know they little gleams of light everywhere and I just think that's interesting because that that's why is because they're meant to like light the way for mankind and help measure footsteps and measure your journey and then we have Enoch who we all descend from as well because he was an ancestor to Noah and we all descend from Noah anyway it's just really interesting again it's like the priesthood lines that Enoch had that was passed to Noah that he passed on to Shem it's the priesthood line that's what it's really talking about and maybe in earlier times that also closely related to bloodlines and groups and stuff and I'm sure some of that is still true today but those bloodlines have been like um spread throughout the world so much at this point that they're mixed into all the cultures that literally we can send missionaries out everywhere to gather Israel because Israel's bloodlines are like mixed into everybody, <laughs> you know, which is really beautiful. Anyway, it totally makes me wonder. I need to go back and copy that part about their like, there's ancient text saying they came from above and we're trying to figure out what that means. And like, is it because it's connected back to that city of Enoch that, that was taken up? And I'm sure the legends that went on and on about that, as people heard about that story, right? Or is it really just like, okay, this ancient priesthood lines came from the gods, they came from Elohim, that kind of thing. So um, let me go back and get that one part. I'm curious what you think. Just to summarize it too, after that part, uh, so when Charlemagne came along, that king, which is really interesting because he had really long flowing red hair. I remember teaching that when I taught in Utah in class and we had to teach about Charlemagne. He had long flowing red hair and he was always seen like riding this horse with his red hair flapping behind him. And he really united and established the Christian church as like Christianity as mainstream. Um, so I've always thought of him as like a good guy and an amazing leader. But it's been kind of interesting some of the stuff coming up about there was a real switch and how things were governed and the control of the Catholic Church on things, like kind of during his reign. So I don't know if that was because of him or because his priests or his, you know, his spiritual leaders, he was following, who knows. But two of the things that happened during his reign is that's when they started diminishing these elven lines and the fairy lines and saying these groups oh they're just they turned them into little mythical creatures that were super tiny so people were like what they're only like you know two inches tall i could squish them with my thumb oh how ridiculous you know total smear campaign and then two they falsified some translations of scripture and said, see, this shows that the Pope is the guy that gets to choose who's, who the ruler is, and the Pope chooses Charlemagne. So whoever the Pope chooses, that is who gets to be king. And then like 400 years later, it was like the 1500s, which is super interesting because that was the, you're getting the Renaissance and then you're getting into the Reformation during that time period. And it was during that time period they went back and they looked at the original text and they were like, they didn't translate this correctly. <laughs> they were like, it, it doesn't say at all that the Pope gets to choose who is king. That's not what this says. But it becomes such a tradition at that point that it was really hard to break off of. But who knows, maybe that helped inspire some of the reformers to be like, we only bow to God. The king is not the head of the church. Only God is head of the church. Like, that kind of thing. That became a big thing around that time. So, anyway, it's just kind of really interesting. Um, makes me want to learn a little bit more about Charlemagne. I know just about everybody traces back to Charlemagne. I feel like he pops up in everybody's family trees all the time. <laughs> um, people are always like, I go back to Charlemagne, and, like, get really excited. And I'm just a little bit more curious about his time period. Because <laughs> it does seem like there are some 
truths that either he or his people that worked for him worked really hard to bury. And it seems like more of that stuff will be revealed as we get closer or in the millennium, you know. So anyway, let me go find that other text and I'll share it here. Okay, here's the rest of it. Okay, so that we're talking about the shining ones or the elves, and that meant the shining ones of the Elohim, and as they were referred to in Sumerian writings. So he is taking the text from the Sumerian people. So from those writings, this is what he read about elfin people. They were called the shining ones of the Elohim, and they were identified with the sky or with a high place described as on, A-N and often translated to mean heaven or the heavens. So they were the shining ones of Elohim associated with heaven. See, this is where I start to wonder, like, are they talking about the city of Enoch? Because they also call them angels. Like some of the translations translate the word, that's like, that's the origin of the word angel, is these elfin people. I don't know, maybe, or maybe it's just, you know, followers of Christ ministering to people and being angels on earth and having that reputation. I don't know. So in this context of the great gods and overlords of ancient Sumer were called the Anunnaki, meaning heaven came to earth. Alternatively, they were the Anunnaki, which means the fiery great sons of heaven. And it was from the Anunnaki royal strain that the grail line ensued. And for this reason, it was traditionally referred to as the Elven Bloodline, or the Dynasty of the Shining Ones. Again, I'm like, this could totally just be a priesthood line. These are just people with the priesthood, because that's the power of, the power to act in God's name, right? The power to perform miracles and to have God's power on earth. So, and they also would have had temples if they had the priesthood and the fullness so if they had temples, that's literally where heaven and earth meet, right? So if they, if they were called the people that, um, what does it say? The fiery great sons of heaven, heaven came to earth is what Anunnaki means. Heaven came to earth. They could just be saying these are people that had the temple and others realize that. It also talks about they come down from a high place. Temples also often used to be up in high mountains. Um, and here is evidence of a Sumerian temple. This is called the White Temple in Ziggurat at Warka. It's from the period 3500 BC. Prior to this temple, there was a pyramid temple below it, and later they built this other temple on top of it. So this pyramid temple below this White Temple, they believe is what influenced the Egyptians to build their pyramids. Now remember, the Egyptians knew that they had lost the priesthood, and they were doing everything they could to get it back. They were trying to build the temples and have the priests. They didn't want to lose that knowledge and those practices, so they kept it going, but they admitted, they acknowledged that they kept it going without the authority, without the power of God. And for a time, the Egyptian government was an imitation of the patriarchal order of the priesthood. So this is just very interesting. Okay, so the Anunnaki, that's like the elven people, not the, that they were known as Anunnaki by the Sumerian people. That's what they called them. Quite who these Anunnaki overlords were is a matter of continuing debate and the extent Sumerian texts, which talk of their coming down or coming from the heavens. Okay, so Beth is going to go on to talk about this goddess that they worshipped named Nin Karsag, who was known as the Mountain Queen, and her name means Lady of the Great Mountain. In this depiction, she is called the Great Mother of the Grail Bloodline and Surrogate Planet. So she was called the Surrogate Mother of... Adama, the earthlings. So she was the surrogate mother of earthlings, Ataba and Kaba, better known as Adam and Eve. And she had kind of alien-like looking features. Now, here's my thoughts on that. Anytime there's like funky, weird looking alien things involved, I always am like, mm. <laughs> could that be though? You know, is that possible that is 
some of the adversary's forces appearing to people or looking like aliens. And especially here, here's Sumerians. They don't have the fullness of the gospel. And they're worshiping this god that is said to be the mother of Adam and Eve. And it looks like an alien. So they're already off because they're worshiping other gods, right? So are they having that kind of stuff where, like, evil spirits are appearing to them and being like, I am the goddess so-and-so. I'm the mom of Adam and Eve. And they look like this alien creature. And they're like, oh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because there's, there's going to be bits of truth in there. But what, but, you know, what has been expounded upon and twisted and changed by a fallen people being led by false spirits. I do think, from what the Sumerians are talking about to me, I read that, and these people that are coming down from high places, um, coming down from where heaven and earth come together, and they are the followers of Elohim, they are the fiery great sons of heaven. I'm like, this is the priesthood and temples. This is what this is talking about, right? And Hugh Nibley talks about, like, everything in the history of the world can be traced back to people trying to get the temple back, like the Great Crusades. Why all these people went from Europe down to recapture Israel is they wanted to get the temple and the temple rights back. They they didn't have them anymore. And Christopher Columbus, um, um, Tim Ballard talks about in his book that what drove Christopher Columbus was not because he was gold hungry. It was he wrote a letter to Queen Isabella explaining that he felt this drive to get the temple back because when you got the temple back, the Savior would return. Everyone was looking forward to the second coming. Everyone has been looking forward for a long time. And why he was he got the funding to go on his journey is because it appealed to Queen Isabella. She was deeply religious, and she too wanted to help usher in the reign of the Savior. She knew how important it was to get a temple back. And so Christopher Columbus said, look, I just feel really like the Spirit is moving upon me to find this route to India. Maybe it's so we can get, um, we can raise the money to be able to go get the temple back. And if we get the temple back, it's going to help the Savior return. And I feel like this is my mission. And so he was really confused when he died because he knew he'd been moved upon it by the Spirit to help do something very significant to bring back the second coming, to bring back the temple and bring back the reign of the Savior. And yet he died, and none of that had happened. And he was really confused by it. <laughs> and it was because it wasn't at the Lord's timetable yet, but he did play a huge role in that. And he said, like, when he was actually going past uh, Panama, he was sailing past Panama, and he looked over and he could see this land of the North American continent, right, that was attached to it anyway. And he said he was touched by the Spirit, but had the impression, was told, that upon that land would the new Jerusalem be built. And so it's just really neat. Like there were so many people in history. We, we're not taught that stuff in school, but it was a driving force between behind so many big events that happened was people wanted to get the temple back. They were obsessed with getting the temple back because in the temple, you received power from on high. Like people realized there was power in the temple. There was um, saving covenants in the temple. So anyway, it is really interesting, all these different writings about the elven people, the shining ones, the people of Elohim, um, the mighty men of heaven, what did they call them? The fiery great sons of heaven. Anyway, it's just so much talk about people that had the priesthood and they had the rights to the temple. And here are other groups going, oh, they've got those things. We wish we had those things. You know, they kind of got reduced down to legend, mythological size and stories around the 800s. Um, and then there was a huge campaign to, like, kill off their descendants. And they killed, what did it say, millions or thousands? Anyway, they, for years, um, track down the descendants of these people and, like, tried to kill them off. So, anyway, I think the Catholic Church definitely felt threatened by this group that had been the rulers before the Catholic Church in Charlemagne came along and said, nope, we get to be the rulers. <laughs> so, anywho, some of the legends obviously are going to just be made, completely made up, but it does make you wonder about 
what truths are coming through in some of these legends. So this reminds me of a tactic that Satan used in the Forgotten Books of Eden. So the Forgotten Books of Eden are a translation that was published in 1882. It's of the first and second books of Adam and Eve that were translated first from ancient Ethiopian texts into the German language and then into the English language later on. It's interesting, in chapter 1 of the book of Adam and Eve, it talks about how they fasted for 40 days. And I just talked about this in my last Happy Lady video, how that number 40 has a lot to do with cleansing out darkness and sort of like a rebirth, a fresh start, starting over with the Lord. So in their sorrow because of the fall, God asks them to fast for 40 days, and at the end of the 40 days, he provides them with coats of skins, according to this text. And all throughout this chapter, it describes accounts where Satan comes along and tries to distract them from their fasting and cause them to sin again and fall away from God. And he's very clever. He uses different tactics and they fall for it each time, but then they realize finally who he is, and then they repent, they turn to God, thinking that the whole time they were following God because Satan's so clever. And so here's one experience where he had just deceived them, and they said, We believed, O oh God, that he was a messenger from you, and we came out with him and knew not where we should go with him. Then God said to Adam, See that this is the father of evil arts, who brought you and Eve out of the garden of delights. And now indeed, when he saw that you and Eve both joined together in fasting and praying, and that you came not out of the cave before the end of the forty days, he wished to make your purpose vain, to break your mutual bond, to cut off all hope from you, and to drive you to some place where he might destroy you. And in this experience here, the Lord says, because he couldn't do anything to you unless he showed himself in the likeness of you. So he wants to appear like you, like a man. Therefore, he came to you with a face like your own and began to give you tokens as if they were all true. So he's trying to show Adam, hey, look, I'm just like you. Look at these tokens. Look at my face. I mean, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm on your side. I'm here to help. And here's an account where Satan appears as though he is an angel from God. He knows that each time he deceives Adam and Eve, he has to step up his game or they're not going to fall for it if he does the same tricks over and over. So this time in this account, it says, again, Satan said to Adam, come back with us. We are angels of God. God sent us to you to show you another field of corn better than that. And beyond it is a fountain of good water and many trees where you shall live near it and work the cornfield to better purpose that which Satan has consumed. So here he is appearing as though he's an angel of God, trying to give them counsel on how to avoid Satan and how to not fall for his tactics. So he's pretending that he's working against himself. It says, Adam thought that he was true and that they were angels who talked with him, and he went back with them. So it goes on to describe all these accounts where Satan has others with him and they are disguised as well so that they look like beings that can be trusted, beings that have Adam and Eve's best interest at heart, beings that are there to work with them or that were sent there from God. And they even point out that, yes, there is a Satan. Yes, there is darkness. And we're going to protect you from Satan. And here in verse 70, it says, after this, the hater of all good took the form of an angel, and with him two others, so that they looked like three angels who had brought to Adam gold, incense, and myrrh. They passed before Adam and Eve while they were under the tree, and greeted Adam and Eve with fair words that were full of deceit, so things that were pleasing to the ear but full of lies. But when Adam and Eve saw their pleasant expression and heard their sweet speech, Adam rose, welcomed them, and brought them to Eve, and they remained all together. Adam's heart, the while, being glad because he thought concerning them that they were the same angels who had brought him gold, incense, and myrrh. So here is an illustration of how Satan mimics what God does. He tries to counter what he sees God doing 
but he twists it and uses it for his own purposes. So he saw that these three angels, which are very symbolic of the three wise men who came to see Jesus, and they bring Adam and Eve gifts to cheer them up, gifts of frankincense, myrrh, and gold. And so he mimics this, and he sends three angels who look just like the three angels that had visited Adam and Eve, who, who truly were from God. And this is how Adam and Eve were able to welcome him in and trust him because of his appearance. He looked like messengers from God. I believe Satan does this today. In fact, I've seen him do this today with other people. I see this happen all the time, and they believe that they are communicating with or being visited by messengers from God. And I believe he has done this all throughout time. So this is why I bring this up, just to show this as another option that as we see these stories and pictures of writings about these gods or angels who visited these ancient peoples and gave them technology, you can see the fruits of whether or not these beings or angels were from God or from the adversary. You can see that in the behaviors of that society. You can see it in their choices and the way that they lived. God's people follow a very specific pattern. Yes, it involves covenants, it involves temples, it involves sacrifices. However, it never involves sacrifices of humans, and it always involves the worship of one God, headed by one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And before Christ was born, he was Jehovah of the Old Testament. He was the God of Israel. And so what you see in the Old Testament with the ways that the people lived and how they served him, you'll see those same patterns in these ancient civilizations. That's how you know that these were a people who were truly worshiping the one true God. Not the God of this world, who is Satan, who pretends to come from other worlds. Now keep in mind that Rome wanted to conquer. And in order to conquer civilizations that were pretty advanced, they needed to spread false information and propaganda. Because if you have a civilization of people that are advanced with their technology, they're happy, they're peaceful, they're loving, everybody who encounters them has nothing but positive things to say about them, the only way to break that is to make up something that's completely outrageous, that would stir up people's emotions and give you that support you need so that you can go in and justify your reason for conquering those people and going to war with them. So Rome did this a lot. And this is something I talk about in my videos. And so you have to remember that, that when you're looking back at these histories, you have to look at what's the pattern here? Is all of this information about them coming from anybody within the Roman Empire? Is it coming from the Roman Catholic Church, from their bishops, their priests, their monks? Is it coming from Roman armies, from the soldiers on the front lines? Who are these people that are sharing these stories and painting these people of Northern Europe as vicious, sacrificing humans, eating their children, right? That will tell you right there every time. You'll also see repeated throughout history in patterns with the Roman Catholic Church is that if they went into an area, if they went to a people and these people already had their own religion, they had something that seemed to resemble the priesthood, they were manifesting miracles, and they called it the power of God, that was a threat to you because why would they want to join your church if what they're doing is working and they're a happy, peaceful, loving people? And if their men and women leaders seem to have a lot of knowledge and a lot of education, that's also a threat to you. So what do you do? You call them witches and sorcerers. These priests and these educators in the community, you call them workers of darkness and you have them executed. It reminds me of the Pharisees, how the Pharisees always accused others and were quick to point fingers at people who seemed to expose their own sins. So to distract from their own sins and their own secret works of darkness and wickedness, they would accuse others and openly persecute them and have them punished. 
and they Christianized all of these nations by force, which we know that is not how the Lord works. He never does anything by force. So we can see clearly who was behind all of these crusades. It was the destroyer destroying all of the books and histories and sacred texts of all of these people and forcing them to conform to the Roman Catholic Church or what they called the Orthodox Christian Church. So if you were a Christian and a follower of Christ, but you believed that the Godhead were three distinct separate beings, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you were considered not a Christian. You were considered a heretic and an enemy of the church. In fact, they would tell everyone that you denounced Jesus Christ, that you did not believe Jesus Christ, that you were not a believer or a follower of Christ, when actually you just were practicing the original teachings of Christ, the original doctrine that was changed at the Council of Nicaea by all of these bishops who decided to conform and create one church that would be the Orthodox Church that everybody needed to conform to or be punished. It's this Nicene Creed that Protestant churches of today follow. It's what resulted in the great apostasy where God's priesthood and his keys and authority were taken from the earth. That removal of light and truth from the earth ushered in what we call the Dark Ages. We would not see any more advancement with technology for centuries until 1830 when God restored his priesthood power and keys back to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith. That's when we see technology begin to advance. We come out of the dark ages and we start to have all kinds of modern day advancements that help further God's work on the earth. Rome had this like total obsession with trying to obliterate the Britons and they never could quite get all of them and they ended up uh, taking over much of their like technologies and claiming it for themselves like the bridges that they build and the roads and stuff that was that's like way older than the Romans being there but the Romans are like yes we did this <laughs> you know kind of thing and then they would tell these awful stories um, and come up with these things because you have the rest of Europe going um, hey Rome why are you attacking these people like they're awesome we send all of our people there to their universities like everybody was sending their their kids and their older whoever went to university back in i mean since ancient times they would go to britain because they they had the best light and knowledge in the world at the time and uh, maybe outside of israel i don't know it depends if israel is an apostasy you know at the time anyway anywho so they would send like there's all these ancient records showing um people really admired britain for their great advancement in music and poetry and wisdom and they had all the best universities in the world at the time and here's Rome trying to take over and like actual Romans and everybody was like uh what's up with you Rome so suddenly Rome's like oh my goodness you know why we need to take these guys over they're killing their babies and they're eating them and they're, they, oh, they do these terrible things. And they would come up with these crazy stuff. Like they said, they would build these huge man-like statues out of logs and put like cages on it. And then they would fill it with people and they'd set the whole thing on fire. And it was their sacrifice to the gods. I mean, they would just totally come up with this stuff. But they never found evidence that this kind of stuff happened. However, Rome started saying this is what the Britons were doing when they wanted to take over through that propaganda they were able to gain throughout europe you know and all the all the ancient civilizations were like oh yeah they those do sound like terrible people oh i guess i mean rome's totally justified in doing what they're doing um because they they came up with all this junk about them so anyway and yet what rome said they were doing 100 percent did not match with all the other records from other civilizations that would visit britain they would all give these glowing reports of how amazing the people were there. So anyway, it totally makes me think. And then the Rome's eventually, Rome eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. And they seem to have the same mission <laughs> to obliterate anyone that didn't agree with their religious philosophies, you know. 
and um, and they would do the same thing. They would go into an area like Ireland or um, any of those areas, and they would burn all the records, and they would just destroy them. And then they would make up stories about these people that they were conquering, to, so it was justified in the eyes of other nations. So anyway... That's what I feel like is the case here with the elves and the fairies and the, the leprechauns is that you have that same type of, of thing going on here, which is what you were touching on too. And, um, and I think probably in different times, um, this happened over and over because it seems to be a pattern. Like the ancient Britons did it about 100, um, BC and further back. I, I don't remember. That's the time period there in Britain, but they were doing that around 100 BC. And then when, Christians that were actual like um, followers of Christ, right? They're all throughout Britain. They tried to conquer them for a hundred years and they couldn't do it. And then um, eventually the Roman Catholic Church was able to take over around four to five hundred years after Christ. And then you see all this stuff coming up again, 800 years after Christ with Charlemagne. So anyway, I do think through throughout time, there's different time periods when this kind of strategy shows itself again. I think it's a pattern. I think it's a pattern something we see today, and we see it just politically. Look at the look at the politics and what people say about the other candidate type of thing. So 